Welcome to the People Teaching People podcast. Joining me on the podcast is Nikki Takahashi. Nikki is a digital media designer and brand strategist who has helped over 300 entrepreneurs embrace and amplify what makes them unique. Nikki is founder and CEO of Fetching Fin, an agency that gets clients noticed in person, online, and in print. She also hosts the Square Peg Entrepreneur podcast, featuring industry disruptors and mavericks in business. Nikki's graphic and website design achievements earned her a Governor General's Medal and the position as spokesperson for Tech 2000. With over 20 years in digital media, she has been featured in marketing articles and on podcasts such as Dissecting Success, Fearless and Successful, and the Business Society podcast. Her keynotes on brand design and strategy have reached audiences around the globe. Nikki's an aspiring videographer and avid traveler who has spent over a quarter century mastering and teaching the art of karate. Her most recent adventures include skydiving over the Canadian Rockies and flying to Berlin for a tattoo. She resides in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Nikki is warm, engaging, and so easy to talk to. This episode will give you great food for thought about your brand, whether you're looking to create one or looking to refresh your existing one and having it authentically represent who you are and what you do, as well as having it be unforgettable. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nikki. Tiana, isn't this exciting? It's always fun to have conversations, especially with local people that I've never met in person, but we have this neat connection we via do. a family member. Isn't it a crazy story? You should tell it. It is a crazy story. So, okay, I'll jump in and share the okay. crazy story. So I have been swimming at a local Calgary swimming pool for at least 14 years. And I've gotten to know people there because there's an early morning crowd and it's the same people that go swimming there all the time. And there's this lovely lady there named Maria that I've gotten to know. And so we talk about like life and things coming up and things that we're doing. And I shared with Maria that I was going to be going to Toronto soon to attend a conference for mom entrepreneurs. And she said, that's so interesting because my niece is going to be speaking at a conference in Toronto for mom entrepreneurs. <laughs> And wouldn't you believe it was the exact same conference? It's such a small world. We both had to travel across the country to be in the same room together. It's uh, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's so bizarre. Mm -hmm. And I love how just sometimes those random conversations or connections with people lead to these other connections. It just makes for such a great story. Well, and what I loved about that too is a lot of my family members have a vague idea of what I do and they may see me posting on social media, but that was such a neat opportunity to have a different level connection with my aunt than I ever had before. And I'm sure it piqued her curiosity too, is how do, how do these two worlds intersect and how does the podcasting work? And you know, all these things that we were talking about, the speaking, um, it was it was really nice. So so thank you for uh, for making that connection and reaching out on social media too. Oh, I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to connect with you and uh, your aunt sure thinks that you're amazing, She's by the way. She's a she sweetheart. She is so sweet. <laughs> I agree. So where I would like to start with our conversation is to learn a little bit more about you and your story. So I'd love to know what your journey has been that's led you to become a digital media designer and a brand strategist. Sure. I often start by talking about how branding wasn't a thing when I was intending to go to post-secondary school. But if I roll back even further, my journey in design and branding, specifically personal branding, probably started with my grandma. And she instilled this in me, in us, me and my cousins, um, probably unbeknownst to her, but she was a hardworking farm wife and later in life transitioned to a city girl. And she went from making the dinners and feeding the cows to becoming this sequined singing superstar in the city. It was just a crazy shift. And so even though just like there wasn't really the word branding back then, 
Um, personal branding certainly wasn't a word, but you could definitely see she had a sense of style. She had a presence. People were drawn to her because she was different. She wasn't afraid to express herself in her own unique way. And that certainly gave us the courage and maybe the temptation to to be a little bit more uh, weird and wild in the way that we present ourselves. Many of my cousins are entrepreneurs as well, so I think it did bleed out. Um, Post-secondary wise, I knew I wanted to do something that was related to graphic design, um, websites. I'm totally dating myself. This is like the 90s, right? So websites weren't a huge thing, but they were coming around. Uh, so I, I really actually dabbled in interior decorating, image consulting, all of these things that make up a personal brand without actually doing what we call today branding, which is more of messaging, logo design, website design. So I explored a lot of areas, a lot of fields that were related, sort of. Now they really enrich what I do and make my services probably more attractive and more valuable to the clients that I serve. It is always so interesting how when we look back at how some of those moments and decisions and things that we did, maybe they don't directly link to what we're doing, but they influence that journey and um, that direction that we end up taking. So when did you start your business? This is my 14th year doing this full time, um, but I did graduate from multimedia school uh, 2001. So it's been a while. It's been a few decades, a couple decades. Um, it certainly doesn't seem that long, but the industry has transitioned a lot. Uh, and that's one thing that I really enjoy about this industry, too, is that you have to keep learning. You have to keep growing because otherwise you don't have clients. You're not you're not at the cutting edge anymore. So uh, it becomes harder as you get older. You get maybe stuck in your ways or um, just committed to a certain style or a certain direction. Um, and of course, things like social media and everything, they, they are moving so quickly. Brands are moving so quickly. Um, it's harder to keep up as well. There's also some deliciousness to it too, because it gives you the opportunity to just stop and say, what actually do I represent as a brand? What do I love about my brand? Where do I feel comfortable? And having the confidence to just be that in a world where everybody is trying to keep up with the trends and be accepted or be the perfect X, Y, Z, right? Sometimes it's cool just to say, hey, this is me. This is my brand and I do it well. I'm good with that. It definitely is easy to look at what other people are doing and think, should I be doing that? Or mm -hmm. shiny object syndrome, right? I should be doing that and that and that and that. But you're right, taking that time to really pause and think about who you are, what do you want to re represent, what is your brand is so important because there's so much going on out there. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get distracted. <laughs> there really is, yeah. And I think as maybe as we mature, we become more content with that, more confident in that. Um, it's, it's often more difficult to appeal to the younger crowd and tell them it's okay to be weird. Some of them aren't ready, right? You know what it was like in school when you just wanted to fit in? Uh, that's what I think entrepreneurs are like when they first start business or maybe the younger generation. They just want to be accepted. Um, but really, the secret sauce, the, the way to really stand out in the spotlight is to be different and show up as that kind of maverick weirdo in your industry. With a kiddo on junior high, mm -hmm. I so relate to what you're saying because I would never want to go back to junior <laughs> high personally. It I is agree. a time in my life I would not want to repeat. High school was better. <sighs> junior high was, I don't know. There's just something about that time. It's so tough. It's, it's so rough. tough. It's rough. Yeah, yeah. And and so I, I, I empathize. I know what it was like. You wanted to wear the same outfits as everybody else. You wanted to look the same way, talk the same way. Um when it comes to business, you can't. Yeah. Well, you can, but you're not going to last long. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. No. Yeah. I love the analogy. It makes me really get it. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I had the opportunity to hear you speak in Toronto at the Mom Entrepreneur Conference yeah. called MamaCon, um, hosted by Mamas & Co., you shared a beautiful and moving story. And then you talked about uh, the use of brand storytelling to create a connection in the market and to really differentiate yourself from the mm -hmm. competition. Mm -hmm. 
So I was wondering if you would mind telling a little bit of the story that you shared. Oh, sure. And then maybe your thoughts on the power of storytelling. Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, the fact that I was invited to MamaCon just makes me giggle anyways, because I'm not a mom. I don't have kids. So so I went into it feeling very much like an imposter, thinking, what am I going to talk to all these wonderfully skilled, talented moms about? How am I going to make that connection? And it was a conversation with the mama and co-founder, Leanne Kim, I was just telling her about what was happening in my day-to-day life. And she says, you have to tell that at MamaCon. So we did weave it in because my talk was about storytelling and the hero's journey um, and how important story is to humans and how everybody relates to a good story. So I did dive in with that and it it worked. Let me start. I'll just, I'll give you a little rundown. So um, the biggest regret in my life is that I never had children. But fortunately, I recently reconnected with the love of my life. He's my first crush from grade one. Um, His wife, unfortunately, had passed away. I reached out. We had some chat and uh, realized that all that, those little bits of dating that we did throughout school, that I'm going to be your backup plan pack that we had in grade 11 that never worked out. Actually, there was some, there was some meat to that. There was some a reason for that. And yeah, we're going to be married in a couple of months. And the fantastic thing about it all is that he brings six children into the mix. So I'm going from zero kids to six kids, which is terrifying and exciting. But I couldn't, I couldn't be happier about the opportunity to have him back in my life and then the gift of these children as well. So, um, you know, when I told it on stage, it did feel very emotional. Uh, I I was weeping like a baby and I think there wasn't a dry in the house if I'm right, if I'm hearing from the feedback. Um, but it was a really nice way to make that connection with moms because it was my first time expressing that I was going to be a stepmom. Um, and a nice segue to how important storytelling is. It absolutely is. And your story is amazing and so beautiful. And how old are your stepkids? Oh, there's a range. They start uh, from nine up into early 20s, 22. So it is it is a range. And, uh, you know, we've got the junior highs and the high school sorts in the mix, too. So um, I'm remembering what that was like for me as a kid and uh, also getting the chance to connect with especially the younger ones and just being playful. lots of craft time, lots of art time. I, that's what I was like as a kid. And luckily, the youngest one is very, very crafty like that. And I really appreciate the fact my day to day as an entrepreneur, s- single woman with one dog entrepreneur, you get a little bit greedy with your time. Um, and I love the work that I do. So oftentimes it was working morning to night with a smile on my face, but people thought I was crazy and probably working too hard and maybe too focused, too serious. This gives me the opportunity to relax, to, of course, just be in the moment with her and these crafts and this fun stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm learning to be a mom and I'm learning to be a kid all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's so nice to have those moments when you can just pause and be in the moment and be Mm. creative or whatever it is um, the kiddos are interested in and loving to do. Yeah. They're good teachers too, right? Oh my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. I learned so much from my kids every day. Absolutely. The questions they ask, the things Uh that they're interested in. And then there's some things I really don't think I'll ever understand (laughs) are... Our 11-year-old, I feel like he's already smarter than both my husband and I. He's, yeah, he's going to be a mechanical engineer. He wants to work for NASA. And he, yeah, 3D printing and computer programming and different things. I have no clue. I They're really fearless, understand. aren't they? They're, yes. it's, it's fascinating. And I'm not sure if we were that fearless at that age. Maybe we were in our own right. But I think, uh, yeah, they're just... Uh, it, well, there's so much opportunity now, right? That's one thing. There's they're accessible to um, and exposed to many things, but uh, yeah, I love watching it too. Yeah, it's exciting to be a part of for sure. Now, um, for businesses, there is a lot of competition and mm-hmm. noise out there, and it can be hard to get noticed. 
So how do you support businesses in discovering and communicating their personal brand's edge and move from unseen to unforgiving? unforgettable. Mm -hmm. It's so fun. I love what I do because it truly is like watching a flower blossom in front of your eyes. People come to me and they tend to seem to have an understanding of who they are and how they should be represented. But oftentimes that's never been done in a visual, digital design sense. And so I know that one of my gifts is being able to make that translation. Uh, and when clients see that on paper, when they hear it in the messaging or where they see it represented in a logo or a presence on the website or social media, it often is a tearjerker as well because they don't know how great they are. It takes somebody else to be looking at them to convey that and to reinforce that. And that's such a confidence builder. Um, so as a, a business person, an entrepreneur, specifically coaches, consultants, speakers, authors, people like that, um, that boost is just gold. Yeah, it can be hard. You're right. Sometimes you get so into what you're doing. It's hard to kind of see that bigger picture and to see how those pieces could be put together or... Um, that brand essence could be put, put together in a way that really communicates who a person is mm -hmm. um, effectively and in a way that will help them get noticed by the people that they're looking for and by, by the businesses they're looking for. It is hard to do it for yourself as well. Like I know that creating my own website or creating my own messaging is always more challenging than doing it for somebody else. Um, so it is nice to to hand that off to a professional who can be very honest and articulate it well. Yes. And when you bring that expertise and that um, and that's your gift, then you're able to provide that direction and that and that insight for people. That must be so rewarding. It's so fun. It is very rewarding. I love I love my work. <laughs> Now, one of the things I've definitely experienced as an entrepreneur, um, as a teacher as well, and pretty much all the way along in my life, is that mistakes are an inevitable, inevitable part of any learning experience. So what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people making when they're building or exploring their own personal brand? Mm -hmm. I think the most common mistake is being really excited about getting a logo. For some reason, that seems to be the starting point in people's heads. That's where a brand begins. Where in fact, you get a better result if you pause, take a look at what your brand style is, your personality, your messaging, get that locked down first. And then that drives the look of your logo and the style. That drives your website afterwards, the content on it, the photography, the lighting, everything. So there is a, a sequence that should be followed to create the best result and get the most return on your investment. And so jumping in and thinking oh, a logo or a website is a way to start actually is probably putting you further behind. So that's really the most common mistake that I see. Um, and then another one, like we've said, is just wanting to blend in, um, be accepted versus standing out. It's a tough one, especially in the early years. And I find it usually takes about three to five years for people to really get their footing, to understand who their ideal client is, to understand who they are and the way, the unique way that they deliver their message, their products and their services. And really at that point, that's a great time to invest in some serious branding. Do a wonderful revamp, revamp of everything at that five-year mark. And I think that would really be a great uh, catalyst for some, some business growth. Well, the fact that I've been doing this particular business for about a year and a half oh. with the summer off makes me feel a little <laughs> bit better that I feel like I'm still kind of getting a lay of the land, figuring things out. I've got time, three to five years. I of feel course. better. I feel okay, better. so this is a great example. Tell me, where did you start as far as branding? What was your What was your conception of it? So I kind of started my business before I had anything. Mm -hmm. So I had somebody come to me and ask if I could help them with something. And they happened to be a chartered accountant. So I thought I better get my ducks in a row. So I got a business number and started working with her. Um, but I think the thing that maybe helped me get started is I know what kind of a teacher I am. Mm. So as a course development consultant, I knew that I wanted my relationship-centered approach to teaching and learning and education to be front and center. 
So I wanted to be really approachable, um, professional, but not um, cold. Like I wanted to use friendly language, engaging language. So people who might be thinking about creating an online course or who are looking for some feedback and updating a corporate training program would feel like I've got their back. I'm not going to just be, you know, judging, criticizing or being really hard on people. I really wanted to work with them and together. Mm-hmm. So I I kind of did that thinking as well and applied it and working with that first client. Yeah. Uh, and then I knew I wanted like calm, neutral colors using that approachable language. So I was in business, I guess, for almost two months before I had colors logo website. But I can see what you're saying. As I even within this first year and a half, Mm -hmm. I've already changed and updated some things. And I can see how looking ahead, um, I can see how I would want to do, as you said, like that refresh and really have um, my brand better represent who I am and what I do. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. funny in those early stages too. We were looking for perfection, right? Every little word, micro, being a micromanager of the designer that you're working with. Ah, you know, every little detail counts so much. And you put it out there in the world, and then, like you said, things just change, and you're not intending it to, but things just change. So it's never perfect. That's another thing that people need to remember about branding is it's always going to be evolving. Your website content is always going to be changing. So get it as close to perfect as you can, but don't make that be the piece that holds you back that you push the pause button on because I've seen that too, where it's just a continual pause for years because in their mind, it wasn't quite right. When in fact, something would have been better than nothing and gotten them further ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was definitely outside of my comfort zone in that I tend to be a person who likes to have all my ducks in a row, but it just didn't work out that way. So I just had to roll with it. Good. (laughs) I'm getting better at (laughs) that. Look at you. (laughs) I know. I know. It's a little, yeah, it's definitely outside of the norm, but I'm I'm getting, I would say, more comfortable with being uncomfortable. So I'm a work in progress. (laughs) We all are. Now you've worked with many brands and clients, um, over 300. Is that right? (laughs) how old I am. That's That's how many years I've been doing this. Yeah, 300 years. You've been in business for 300 years. 300-ish, yeah, (laughs) give or take. So based on your experience, which industries do you feel can benefit the most from uh, leveraging their strong personal brand presence? Or is there certain industries that can benefit the most? Well, I see, uh, for the most part, like I said, coaches, consultants, speakers, authors, trainers, People who are really the face of their business need a strong personal brand. And for example, coaching in a world today where every second person is a coach of some sort, you need to be able to stand out. You need to be able to clearly express how you're different, how your services are different than the next coach. So it's critical in those industries. One industry that I'm exploring keenly right now is uh, salons and stylists. Um, that industry and also realtors, both of them really need strong personal brands, um, especially the salon and the stylist, because in my experience, stylists go to hair school, not necessarily with the mindset that they need to be running their own business. Even, you know, they're in a salon, they could be chair renting. Um, They still need to get their guests, their clients in the door. And that's often where they fall short. My brother and his wife have a couple of high-end salons. And so I've seen this happen. Um, If they were able to really get a grasp on their personal brand, specialize in something, talk on social media about a certain niche, a certain technique, versus just being the stylist for everyone, kids, adults, men, women, I mean, I think they would go further faster. So I'd really like to focus some time in 2023 on that area, just as an experiment. I'm going to experiment in these salons that my brother owns and and see what I can do to really amp up business and the confidence in these stylists to be more personal brands. I find that so interesting. Uh, I think about, it just makes me think about the realtors that I've worked with over the years, just with the different homes that we've purchased. Um, But especially my um, hairstylist, I've actually 
she does, there's something about her that I just love. I've been going to see her since I was 20 and we're the okay. same age. So for 24 years, it's crazy. Wow. Wow. But, but she has a certain style to her and I, and a certain way of being. And I know that she has certain sort of ways of cutting hair and certain types of clients that she definitely aligns best with. But I think there's a real journey that goes along with Mm. discovering that niche, that area. And you're right. I don't think there is like a huge or any marketing piece in the training that a stylist would get. I love that you're exploring that idea. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. And, you know, to your point about your stylist, I'm curious, like when you first started going to her, was that something that she communicated or something that you saw that drew her to you? Or did it just happen to a line that you liked that after you met her? Was it yeah. something she was portraying first? I don't. I think I just really liked her. I felt comfortable with her. Um, she didn't ever, she's never tried to push me outside of my comfort zone. Like she'll make suggestions, but she'll always go with what I want. And I find, you know, as I spend a lot of time at the salon when I go for my appointment because I'll get highlights and a haircut and the whole, so it's like a two, two and a half hour thing. So yeah. she's also like my hair, therapist. Like yes. we talk about everything. She knows all my deep, dark secrets and we've become <laughs> friends. So I think if there was a stylist that didn't like to talk or I didn't feel comfortable sharing you know, my mm-hmm. deepest thoughts and ideas with that wouldn't align well with me. Or if it was a person who was really out of the box and was always wanting to try or push something new, that wouldn't have aligned with me. And she just mm-hmm. lets me be who I am. And I feel really comfortable. So I just keep going back. Isn't that funny how at the end of the day, it may not necessarily be about, I'm sure she's very talented, necessarily about the way she cuts hair or her scissor skills but truly about her personality and that connection and warmth that you have with her um just totally unrelated to the industry and very much about her personal brand that's good yeah yeah I'm gonna have to talk to her about this now the next time I go see her (laughs) (laughs) good I love it now you also host a podcast um and so just in that idea of talking to people and interacting with people and getting to know people it's such i find hosting a podcast is such a great opportunity for me to get curious and your podcast i love the name square peg entrepreneur so i wanted to first of all find out the story behind the name of your podcast and then what have you learned by engaging in the conversations with, as you call them, industry disruptors and mavericks in business? Mm-hmm. Well, the name, I mean, clearly everybody, well, the brave, savvy personal brands want to be that square peg, the one that stands out that doesn't quite fit in. So I like the name too. Um, I, I borrowed it from one of my clients actually came up with it. So I I, I stole it actually outright. <laughs> But uh, it works. I love it, too. Um, And speaking with the guests that I have on there, you know, the whole idea of Square Peg Entrepreneur came about because in the course of trying to inject the confidence in the clients that I was serving, I was relaying a lot of stories about other people in the industry, other clients that I had been working with. So it was more just easier easy for me to document the story on a podcast versus regurgitating it every time. Um, you start to learn so many different facets about the people that you thought were just one angle. I love that about podcasting. Um, And I also enjoy just the regular conversations, not necessarily having scripted questions all the time, but letting it flow. Uh, If you're somebody who maybe doesn't normally like the spotlight or isn't comfortable on video or on audio, pushing yourself to get in on these platforms in front of a camera it's the best way to do it and so as a podcast host you have no choice right so there we go yeah oh my goodness absolutely absolutely now do you have a favorite guest or someone that really stands out for you oh 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 okay that's that's unfair they're all gonna be angry (laughs) okay one of your many favorite guests just a, maybe a conversation that stands out for you that really had an impact on you or just so, someone that you love talking about a particular episode that you've had. Okay, sure. I'm going to say my business coach, uh, Leona, she was a guest on my podcast. When we're talking about coaches standing out as personal brands, 
she's a client as well. And her brand definitely is differentiated. She's all about joy. And I don't mean just be happy. There you go, period. It's like confetti flying around, like crazy songs and dance moves. Like she is joy in a package. And so speaking to her, getting her perspective on branding, getting her perspective on coaching, and then also her personal stories are just fascinating too. She she did write a book. I, your guests should check out that episode of the okay. podcast and grab that book. Yeah. Okay. I'll joy. make sure to share a link good, specifically good. to that episode. Yes. Oh, she'll, oh. Be, she'll be tickled. <laughs> one of your favorite guests. There one we of go. Your many favorite guests. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of favorites, a question I like to ask my guests is about a favorite teacher or learning experience that they've had. Mm. I definitely have one myself, and it's um, one that I talk about all the time. But who would be the person or experience that really stands out for you? Well, some people may not know this, but I did have 25 plus years learning karate. I was in martial arts. And so I would definitely say hands down my sensei, my karate teacher, definitely my favorite, maybe not for the reasons that you would expect. Very traditional, old school Japanese Okinawan, truly just like the karate kid, the Mr. Miyagi, right? Except probably maybe not, maybe a little bit more intense. So there was no wiggle, wiggle room. If you wanted to be good, you had to put in the time and the energy. And fortunately, my personality is I'm going to push myself as hard as I can. So he was a perfect teacher for me because he he loved he loved it when you were at your limit, when you were crying, when you were about to throw up. Like I think we all just love that kind of experience in the in the dojo. Uh, so he was certainly my favorite teacher. And if um, if I'm being honest, the skills that I learned in the dojo translate to exactly the kind of entrepreneur that I am. That grit, that don't give up, take the punches type of resilience. I think those are skills that I wouldn't have otherwise known, learned, and certainly do serve me today in business. Is he someone you still stay in touch with today? You know what? Not as much as I should. He's He lives in Lethbridge, so uh, we're a couple hours away. He's best friends with my mom, so I should see him more often. But uh, after this, I will connect. There's my promise. <laughs> Aww, yeah, it's so amazing to have those really impactful people in our lives and and how they impact us so much beyond the experience where we've spent time with them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, when you look back at your journey so far, what would be something that you're the most proud of? I distinctly remember the day that I switched from working a corporate job in digital media to going out on my own. Um, I had been part-time freelancing to that point, and I was marking on the calendar at work, counting down the days till I was going to go full-time. It was absolutely terrifying and exhilarating all at once. As you probably find when you're talking to people who are full-time entrepreneurs, they look back and go, why didn't I start sooner? This is this is just perfect. This is the, the absolute best kind of career move I could have made. And that's true for me too. Um, yeah, I... I Probably should have done it sooner, but also the corporate job that I was at um, was also very enriching and taught me a lot of things, gave me the opportunity to learn a lot of things too. So, uh, but that was really probably the moment that I'm most proud of, the courage to do that. Yeah, it does take courage to take that leap. It does. Yeah. Now I have some rapid fire questions for okay. you. Okay. Uh, the first one is, what is something that you would love to learn about or something that you would love to learn how to, how to do? I think I would be a good car mechanic. And I don't know why. I don't know the first thing about it. It's just so different from what I do. Like getting gritty and dirty and working with your hands versus sitting at a desk all day. I think I would love that. That would be very cool and very useful. I know. I'm all about practicality. <laughs> well, if you do go that route, let me know because we can use help at our place from time to time. Oh, okay. <laughs> You'll know me by my branding. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'll, I'll be yeah influenced and attracted by your amazing branding. There we yes. go. What is a place that is at the top of your travel bucket list? 
right now it's uh, Cappadocia. Uh, that was a place that we were intending to visit right before COVID and didn't get the chance to. Um, if you're not familiar, that's the the spot in Turkey with the beautiful hot air balloons and the 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 places where you get the beautiful images of you and your flowing dress and the the scenery behind it. That's that's the dream. So I would love to visit Cappadocia. Do you have a plan to go? No, but I do love travel. I have a travel bug and I like very spontaneous travel. So um, there has been a lot of travel in between that time since, and I'm sure there will be more before I get to this destination, um, but it'll be, it'll come. That sounds wonderful. What is a book, podcast, movie, or TV show that you've enjoyed recently? I always go back. This isn't... Um, it's a rereader for me. It's my favorite book. It's The Art of Nonconformity by Chris Gillibo. When I was first starting out in business, I I just salivated on his stuff because it was all about living like it is all about living life differently. There you go. That's personal branding, right? Doing things different than the norm. Um, it's a wonderful, inspiring read. If people are looking for options and alternatives or different ways of thinking, I would recommend that one. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Okay. Not one that I've heard of. So one I oh. will be checking out. Okay. If you could sit down and have a conversation with someone that you would love to learn from, who would it be and why? Hmm. This is a tricky one. I actually would probably go back. My grandmother has passed away. I would probably go back and have a deep conversation with her about being yourself, representing yourself, taking brave, bold steps. Um, the thing that she did in her lifetime just blow my mind. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have the courage to do them. And she certainly did and did it well and did it with flair and style. So I think I would go back and learn from her differently than I did before. I was, I was a grandchild then. I think I would do it as a business person. Yeah. Have some different kinds of questions. And exactly. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Grandmas are special. My grandma was one of my best friends. So really? Yeah. I, I always think of so many questions I wish I could ask her now too. Mm. Now, education truly plays an important and integral role in all facets of our lives, how we work, live, play, explore, and do business. Do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom for our listeners um, that might empower or support them with their own teaching and learning journeys. Mm. It's funny because uh, when we first started to connect about this podcast topic, I totally forgot that I used to teach karate. After all of those years, I did become a teacher of it. And so I start to compare how I was as an instructor in martial arts versus how I am as a quote unquote teacher to my clients and how to represent their personal brand. And they're both very different. I would just say, do it authentically you. There's so much editing happening right now. Everything needs to look so perfect. Everything needs to look curated. Oh my gosh, just be you. If you want to cuss a little, cuss a little. If you if you want to make your student throw up, it's okay. Their parent might not like you the next day, but that's okay if that's your style. So I would say really lean into that and have the guts to just do it. do it your way. That's great advice. And Nikki, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time, your story, and your words of wisdom with us today. If our listeners want to learn more about you and all the things that you're up to, where are the best places to find you? Sure. I'm on social media at most often at the Nikki Tack, T-H-E-N-I-K-K-I-T-A-K. And my website for my design business is fetchingfin.com. So it's a terrible choice because it's hard to spell on audio. <laughs> Nobody really ever understands it. When I say it on the phone, it's hard to it's hard to articulate. So please put it in the show notes so people can find I the will, link there. I will. And before I let you go, I must yeah. ask about fetching fin. Okay. <laughs> so how did how did that name come to be? Well, I've never been one nonconformist. I'd never been one to spell it out directly. And it truly was. It was a second puppy named Finn. I was trying to start up my full-time business and he would 
not lay off bugging me, wanted to play, wanted to fetch, right? So I would throw the ball for him and he would just stare at it. He didn't know how to fetch. He wanted to play, but he didn't know how to interact. So the name, it really was like an 11th hour thing. And I was probably delirious and sleepy. I thought fetching Finn is hilarious because I have the one dog in the world that actually can't fetch. So I went ahead and incorporated it. And now, I mean, he's one of the world's greatest fetchers. So it's not even funny anymore. It's it's really a, a really silly story today. But back then, I, it was my own inside joke. <laughs> I love that so much. And it's such a great story, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Such a good story. And that's such a big part of what you do. It really is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nikki. It was so nice to connect with you today and to learn from you. Thank you. Nice to speak with you too.